Hello guys, I'm Susana Medina. I want to start with a, a tale. I'm gonna share the screen. Once upon a time, there was a, a girl who lived uh, in a magical world uh, called Vallecas. <laughs> I don't know if you know Vallecas, but it's a really poor neighborhood of Madrid. Right now it's really better than in the 80s. Uh, I was lucky enough to grow in this uh, Cool, exciting, and and super uh, exciting. Sorry, exciting neighborhood full of uh, peculiar people, uh, incredible alive uh, neighborhood. Uh, we used to play uh, on the street. <laughs> on the street, really. Right now, uh, you cannot play on the street because you are you are grown ups, grown ups. But uh, when uh, I was a child. We, we used to play a lot uh, around our buildings and with people. And in Vallecas was a really special place to live in that age because uh, we were um, in, between, in between the city and a village. So it was some kind of a village in that, in that sense. If um, this, this has houses behind, you can see, you know, behind me. Uh, there, you can see a, a guy sitting uh, close to his house. So this was like a you know a day day by day. So you uh, you could see all the neighbors around, and you can uh, talk with them, and they all always be aware of uh, your your you know your your things and and your father and your mother. So they knew everything about your life and about you. So it was like a, some kind of a village. So in the 80s, because I, uh, I born in the 80s, in the 80s, some, this computer uh, went to my house <laughs> really, and it was like a wow, like a wow for me like a really big moment in my life because I start um, playing games with my mother and my brother and I realized that, wow, the games are super amazing and I want to play the whole time and it, it became an, an obsession for me. It became an obsession for me. So I was playing the full day with my mother and my brother and it starts uh, to me like a, my f first big obsession. My first game, uh, the first game I played uh, was this, uh, Aumomi. It's a really, I am gonna share the, the sound because I didn't share the sound. Sorry. Uh, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm really newy with Zoom. How can I put uh, the just sound? click on the share screen button and then you have a little checkbox there that says share sound. You have to click again on the share screen on the green button and you will see a little checkbox. Or another option you can stop sharing and then start sharing again and you will see it. Better it's easier for me. Easier. Easier for me. Okay. Screen and click on the share computer sound. Now you can see my screen? Yep. Super. Okay, so this is the, the first game I played in my Amstrad CPC 464. That it was the, my first computer ever. You can see. Working? Yeah, okay. Okay. To start the game, we have to run manually. Just you know, type in run and click on enter or press on enter. Better. So this was. I, I remember my my mother and my brother playing this game for hours, and it was really simple. It was like a some kind of puzzle. So you have to release the mummies in the, in the coffins. So you have to find one key to open the next level. So it was really, really straightforward and easy. Okay. Okay. So 
it became a, a, a really obsession in my life. So I started uh, writing documents about uh, games. I started um, writing reviews about all the the games I played. Um, it was a really obsessive in that point with the with the games. So you can see here is a real <laughs> uh, paper from my childhood. So I wa was describing here a, a game called After the War, that it was some kind of a shooter, platform shooter. And uh, it was like, a, for me, it was a wow, uh, graphics or art, 10, uh, mechanics, 10, or super, you know, a super, super, super game. And it was, I can show you the real game <laughs> now. Uh, let me see. So, but first I want to share that Without obsession, life is nothing. So for me, uh, it was my first obsession in my life, but I, I, I had a lot in my life. But um, this obsession of gaming, it still is now. So without obsession, life is nothing. And this is a sentence, a quote from uh, John Waters that is a filmmaker, like an independent filmmaker, some kind of independent filmmaker from US. So uh, it was really important for me. This is the, the game that I showed you before in my, in my notebook, in my old notebook. So you can see that it wasn't uh, so surprising and so awesome, but for me, it was like amazing. And here you can see um, the art for, from this game is from Aspiri, that it was uh, like an amazing illustrator from the 80s. And uh, the good thing of this, uh, Yes, it was uh, not only the games, but the the art on the boxes. You can you could buy the box, and you had an ama amazing art, especially in the like they call the gold age of uh, Spanish games. Dynamic had a really an amazing artist working for them. Okay, next. So, uh, so as you can imagine. This obsession who, uh, changed my my life in that point. So I used to go to these kind of arcade venues <laughs> close to my house. I spent all the money there. Um, it was a really uh, peculiar uh, places in because uh, you can imagine that in the 80s we didn't have a lot of uh, control about the ages in these venues. So. You, you could see people from 18 years old or people from seven years old and people smoking. So it was some kind of a mess and some kind of a strange um, you know, places to go. But we used to go a lot uh, of the, uh, to these places to play and to spend the day talking about games and talking with friends about the level I, I pass, uh, whatever around games and this is a photograph of my <laughs> childhood and I don't want to share with you uh, who is me but, <laughs> but you can see you know the, the clothes and it's super old from the, from the 80s and I want to show with, uh, with this um, photograph something that it was super important for me uh, in that um, time of our um, of Spain or of the education in our country, um, they were super super strict with the um, with the matters we had to study and with the things we have to study for our you know future work. So uh, I remember once that uh, one teacher told me when I was trying to draw in something in my dashboard, uh, he told me that she told me that. Uh, I I never be I will never be someone if uh, I you know I was always drawing in my notebook and I couldn't understand why because um, I I saw in that day that the illustrators could have work or whatever but in that age I think uh, you know the artistic uh, field uh, if you think in game in games. You can imagine, so it was completely out of uh, conversation. Uh, it was like a, a dream. So uh, you had to you had to focus on something real. Something real was 
uh, go to science, go to uh, in relation with law, or, or you know, so really, really strict and really straightforward on this on this sense. So a game design for me in that point it wasn't a possibility to study. It's really different from now. So I want to share with this quote from Shigeru Miyamoto that uh, said, video games are bad for you. That's what they say about rock and roll. So that uh, what I want to share with you is that uh, if you feel that uh, you are doing something that is strange for a lot of people, but you feel that is good for you, continue with the, with this. Because, you know, uh, in my, when in the eighties, they didn't know that the games will be so big right now. So uh, they didn't understand that you can work in games. Uh, that's the same with rock and roll when they create this kind of music. Okay, so this I want to share. My, my reference is not only games. So I think as a game designer, designer and, as a, and a, as a creative person that uh, we are, the game designers, uh, we have to have and we have to um, uh, feed our brain or many, many reference. For example, other games, music, uh, art, uh, cartoon, movies, etc. So uh, I think it's super important. And everything I ever love has led me to what I am right now. So I think that all these reference and all these movies, comics, and things I did in the past, this is what I, I am today. This is because I am today like this. So I am Susana Medina, game designer. Um, I was a publicist uh, before game designer for five years in advertising and now I'm working 14 years in game designer, as game designer and in game design. I want to show you some games I've worked on. Uh, I was working in Piro Mobile that is really well known because of uh, Commandos. Maybe you know this game. But uh, in Piro we had another part of the company that it was completely um, making games for, for mobiles from the beginning. So it was Piro Mobile at the end. Uh, the name uh, before was Play Wireless. So in Piro Mobile, it was my first company after the master. I did a master in production and game design. And I, I did a lot of games, really, really small games in three months, six months, really a small games for J2ME. That is a technology, a really old technology for uh, brick mobile phones, <laughs> you know, you remember the um, Motorola or the, su the super famous uh, Nokia. So this kind of game that uh, had a really low memory and in three months we delivered um, a game for this kind, these mobiles. So I did a lot of mini games like Bacterium, it was a puzzle, uh, adventure games. I did a an MMO for PC as well in Pino Mobile that it wasn't for mobiles, it was for PC and Mac. It was an MMO from the, uh, for uh, the movie Planet 51. Oh, sorry. And a flash game as well at the end and one iPhone game. After Piro, I went to Coboyo, a French company, and I worked in, in between Paris and Madrid, and uh, we deliver simulation games for Facebook, like Pyramid Bill or Smutty Tales. Uh, Pyramid Bill is really similar to Farm Bill, but with pyramids, you know, <laughs> like a thing. And after this, I went to Bitun, and I was working in a basketball MMO that is like a rarity, a really rare, um, year in in you know in in the company in the games and i deliver as well uh, I, iphone games and flash games and at king i i was working at king five years and i deliver like uh, some new games like scrabby dabby uh, diamond diaries and i work as a game design creating content 
for Candy Crush Saga in Stockholm. I was working there as well, and Pyramid and Puzzle Games, Match Games. And now in Outfit 7, I only working for six months, seven months, and we deliver one, one game really fast, uh, Tom Skyrun, that uh, finally we, <laughs> we had to remove from the store because we decided to move to another you know, kind of game that we deliver. And we, I am in the creation of a new, new game, new runner game for the company. Okay, so I'm gonna stop in that point and i want uh, i want to start with working in video games that is you know for you is like a, the most interesting part right because there is my background so um you are in first grade right in like in first the first year okay so yeah maybe you don't know that in in game companies we don't only have game design or uh, programmers or artists. We have a lot of people in, the co in all the companies. Uh, we have game designers, developers, artists, backend, that is another kind of um, programmers that I, are in charge of the things that you don't see, you know. Marketing guys, producers that are in charge of um, the organization of the teams and the more like um, personal uh, between teams as well, personal things. Uh, QA that are in charge of test the games and test everything we do. IT guys that are in charge of fixing all the problems with our mobiles or our computers. Or for example, I broke my telephone yesterday and I had to call IT guy to, you know, <laughs> taking back my mobile and fix it. So this kind of guys. And we have more people. A Scrum Master, that is like a new role that it becomes like um, seven, eight years ago, that, it, uh, that are, are in charge of the dynamics of the team. So they make team works, um, workshop, um, workshops, a lot of things just to um, like improve the quality of, uh, of the team and, and the mood of the team sometimes. Data scientists, scientists that uh, is new as well from three, four years ago, no, five more or less, because I start working with data scientists at King, for example. Uh, this is a super important role right now because they, they are in charge of all the track we are in, putting in our game. They track everything and they can um, give us a lot of examples how, could, how ca can we improve the game. So this is amazing. Uh, I couldn't imagine uh, how we can improve our games in the past with these data scientists, um, but now it's like something super, super important that we cannot live with them. <laughs> and HR for um, obviously the people that are in charge of the people and you have problems, you know, I don't know, with um, you cannot go to, you have to talk with them. Uh, localization guys, in a lot of companies we have um, a team in charge of the localization of the translation of the game, for example. Customer service, that are the people that are uh, in, in direct contact with, the, with our players. So if they have problems, they can ask to these people. Business performance, that is really in, in, in relation with data scientists. Music, and many more. Musicians, uh, for me, uh, a lot of people ask me about uh, if they can work in, in the music of a game. And for me, it's the, wow, the, the role that, more, more, the most difficult role, role for a, a company because sometimes there's only one guy for the whole company. So there's a lot of people that wants to work in music or, or FX, but there is no space for them. Mm, the companies don't have a lot of people of, you know, this department. And many more. Uh, I think, uh, for example, now in, in Outfit, we have uh, like interme intermediate roles that are in relation with the producer and the game design. We have product managers that are, are in charge of the product of the game, but in like a more high level sense. So 
there is a lot of roles in the game industry, not only game designer or developers. So you can think that you can choose more things to work in the future, in more things. So the hierarchy in, uh, in, game, in game design, that is my role, is really self-aware and you can, maybe you know already. So you start like intern or junior game designer. You will, um, if you go, everything goes well, <laughs> you will become a game designer. After senior designer is when you are like working for five years, but it depends on the company. The companies, they, maybe you have a faster progression. No, they're not at all. <laughs> Lead designer, principal designer, and creative director is like uh, in charge of, you know, all the designers of, uh, for example, a company. If a company, you are doing five games, and there is like five principal designers, and the creative director is like, you know, the boss of all. Um, yeah, in the chat, I have to read the chat because maybe there is one question. How do I have to kill to become a creative director? You can so read that, but actually it's full of jokes and stupid things now. No, I want to read it. No, ah. because it, no, it's super interesting because this is my question as well. <laughs> How do I have to kill to become a creative director? Because I'm, after 14 years uh, of working as a game designer, I'm not a creative director. And I, I beat uh, uh, when I was in advertising. After five years working, my last work, work was creative director of one company. So it's more difficult, <laughs> in, you know, in games. It's really, really more difficult. And, you know, after the hierarchy, for, uh, if, um, as you know, there's not only one uh, role um, if you want to work as game designer. There's a lot of types of game designers. We have like the, the, um, the regular game designer that uh, in many small companies is in charge of everything, but in uh, bigger companies, we have different roles and with a really specific um, job. Uh, the level designers that are in charge of the levels, like uh, the word said. Uh, narrative designers that are in charge of the test, the story, the, um, describe the characters, for example, and the system designer that's in, really in relation with the game design, with the regular game designer, and this is part of the mechanics and the um, system of the game. <laughs> okay, and uh, I want to share with you this because, for example, in my um, job, uh, my last five years, I'm focusing only in casual games. Not in the past, but, but right now, yes. But in casual game, there is a, a, a lot of um, kind of games as well. But I want to share with you this because this is not only casual in mobile games. There's casual, there's mid-core, uh, we have uh, hardcore, and we have hyper-casual. But I, I don't know you hear about hyper-casual, but uh, um, there's like a bunch of apps right now in, in the market that are called hyper casual and are based in a, like an, a basic uh, game mechanic and they put uh, advertising a lot um, uh, that's all so for me it's not uh, like a market for me it's a type of of, mar ma of mar marketing, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? It's different because the casual, you can drive uh, your casual game with ads or with money, uh, you have to pay for the app and that's all. But the hyper casual, it drives always um, with ads and with a really basic core. Sometimes they, they don't have even music. So it's only for, ga uh, for game uh, or for play, one hour and left. So they release a lot of games, so they want to keep this flow of they are, you are you know down, downloading all these kind of games and that's all. So for me, it's a type of um, market, different market. No, no, it's a game for me, a different game. So we, but casual, it's not a different game for me. It's a casual, but with another system of ads. And the gems, well, 
there is a bunch of gems that we have in mobiles. Um, for, for example, I was, uh, you know, uh, marking the the games that we are working on in outfit. And now right, we had virtual pet games. Uh, we have endless runners, and we are working in battle royale. So, um, and there's not only one year in one game. So you can have an action game with um, simulation. You can have a strategy game with uh, a trivia. Uh, you know, so you can mix. And there's a in the market right now. You you can see this example. A lot, so they are like mixing journeys to find a new a new solution. <clears throat> and the casual games, uh, in specifics, uh, this is like uh, for me the five things important things from casual games is that they have wide audience, easy to play, simple rule, rules, short sessions, and they are fun or cheerful theme. So all the casual games are uh, has these specifics and for example i can talk about a uh, casual core gameplay in these games so this is an example of the difference uh, difference between uh, casual games so there's not only one type of casual game for example if you think in casual way, games you always think in candy crush for example but it's not uh, uh, farm beer is a casual game it's a simulation game it's a really complex game to do by game design i i tell you so uh, a puzzle game for example a uh, 2d physics a puzzle a hidden object that are really pretty popular in the market and they if you look for hidden objects in games in the market in apple in the apple market or in the i uh, sorry android you will see a lot and why there, there's a lot because they are successful they are winning money they earn a lot of money with these games <clears throat> trivia games that are really pretty popular and they are really top on the gross bookings games and car games there's a lot a bunch of games uh, and i want to put you an example so how you can um, change the basic mechanic of a casual game so not only uh, uh, the casual game has a lot of types but with one mechanic you can have a lot of different games for example the match three three oh, sorry match three from candy crush uh, you can change a bit the the way of you use the mechanic and you have a new game for example a clicker what is a clicker? It's a match three as well. You have to um, uh, press or you have to uh, get together three or more uh, pieces of the same color, right? So in the match three, you move, you swipe. In the clicker, you, you click with your head, with your finger. In the bubble shooter, you shoot a bubble. The linker, you link with your finger slider you slide so imagine how, how many possibilities you have only one mechanic and you can create a lot of different games with this mechanic and as the end of uh, this so <laughs> the casual things i want to share with you is a good practice in casual in my experience is the core is uh, the core gameplay has to be fun this is the most important thing the most important thing the first thing you have to prototype and to test again and again uh, before art or before a more complex system on the top of the game is the core. The, the core gameplay has to be fun. The core is the basic mechanic. Uh, short game game loops is really it's really important that uh, we have short game loops in our game because we have to think uh, the use that uh, we are gonna do of this game. The casual game is played by people that has, for example, one hour to play if he has or she has, or five minutes. So we have to be sure that we have short game loops to play. That is because it's casual. If not, it's hardcore if you have to spend one hour <laughs> to finish a loop, you know. Uh, it requires low skills, but at the same time has depth. 
So uh, yeah, it's simple, but uh, has a meta progression. A meta progression, I mean that uh, you are progressing, you you have talents in your way. So yeah, it's, it's easy, but uh, you can manage to have talents every day. <clears throat> And the keyword is puzzle, but at the same time, it, it can could, could be another thing. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> it's obvious that uh, the puzzle is a really, the puzzle mechanics are really good in casual games. But if you have a mechanic that is simple, could be work as well. And the difficulty is less important than variety. This is, a, for me, it's super important as well because. Uh, make difficult again is really easy, but um, the variety is really difficult to give. So you have to, um, uh, when you create a game, you have to think really well that uh, you are giving um, from time to time something interesting to the player, something, something to, um, something new, something you know, variety. And luck, especially in these casual games, plays an important role. And the balance between luck and skill will determine your audience. It is super important. This is you know, that is super real. That, uh, for example, um, if your game you have a balance, uh, really unbalanced between luck and skill. If the skill is really high in relationship in relation with the luck, you have you have a, a hardcore game. You don't have a casual. So must to be balanced and the lack must to be important because the player has to must to feel that every time is different and they can achieve it okay we okay <laughs> i stop with that point do you have any questions and i will continue with the methodologies and the framework i think there's one question in the chat yeah Questions, questions. <laughs> you can go ahead. Yeah? Live if you want. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about uh, narrative, uh, narrative design. Narrative design. What do you want to what that, what do you want to know? Well, I wanted to ask you if you have any experience uh, in it, so if you can share it with us, please. Uh, it's it's a branch of game design of game designing that I am very interested. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting the game design in relation with the narrative. Uh, I had experience in the past. I did a small game that it was based in one story I created, and I created all the characters. But right now, I'm not working in the narrative. But uh, I, I could share uh, more things uh, for you. For example, um, I think a good narrative designer uh, should have uh, like a preparation or studies in narrative. You know what I mean? So, yes. uh, for example, I work with really good narrative designers and all the narrative designers I work on, uh, they weren't game designers. Yeah, and they mm, were writers or um, um, a script. They were working in scripts, for example, for movies. And they specialize uh, in the last year in game design. But from the beginning, they weren't um, being part of the game design team. You know what I mean? So, um, and it's really difficult to find a a narrative designer that it works only in uh, game design from the beginning. So I think maybe in the next year we will have more narrative designers and really from <laughs> with the studies and from you know our colleagues. But right now there is not so many. And you can start working, for example, I, I know one really good um, uh, narrative designer that is working Last, in, in London, that is a good friend. And uh, it, he worked in a lot of uh, independent companies. So he uh, grew as a narrative designer in independent companies because in the big companies, it's really difficult to go to the narrative directly because they have uh, 
writers, and they have people that are, um, are working in movies, and they are working in the narrative des designer, not the game designers. So you would recommend to, apart from studying what, 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 what we're studying right now, to get some kind of extra extra teachings from someone who knows about about writing apart from video games um scripts or something yeah totally totally okay totally you. totally it's a good it's a good it's a good thing to do yeah it's super important uh, how to for example um the script and uh, there is a good book called I can't remember. I read uh, when I was super, super young, but they, it was uh, from Chinatown, the movie. Uh, they say that is the perfect script. So in, in this book, they talk about the, um, how they build the, um, the script. And uh, uh, while, while they, are, they are describing the script, they are, um, they are talking about maybe 90 of uh, the scripts are uh, are written you know they is the same every every time so we have like a the start um like a conflict and a solution this is like the three steps so for sure uh, studying things like a script scripting or um, um writing or i don't know poems as well and creativity as well could be super super useful for you yeah yeah totally and for and obviously play narrative games that there's a, a bunch of, of narrative games right now for example now i have friends working in narrative in mobiles and they are not so happy because you know they are there's no big uh, games in mobiles in narrative but uh, they are working a lot because uh, I don't know if you know choice, Choices, the game? Yeah. Yeah, so they are working in this kind of games right now. And they are pretty popular uh, between women of 40s. This is uh, like, uh, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't really gotten into Choices. I mean, I've seen it advertised. But I sh uh, usually I, I look into more PC games for... For, uh, looking for interesting narrative, so maybe I should give it a a chance. If, if you see, yeah, if you see the narrative, if you analyze the narrative of, of a game right now, of a console game, uh, it's like a movie. <laughs> it's exactly like a movie. They have uh, the starting point, they have conflicts, conflict, conflicts at the end, they have the resolution. So it's the same. So I think it's, um, maybe studying theories from a script and and tales, how to, you know, tell a tale or something like this will be super useful. Okay, one really quick comment from the teacher. Um, ah, well, one really quick thing. You have a narrative uh, design subject in the in this degree. So in I think it's a third year or fourth year, you will learn a little bit about narrative design. Mm -hmm. And another one is they asked me to record only the presentation and then stop because otherwise they said it was going to be too long with so many questions. So let's go with the presentation and at the end then I stop recording and then we can talk as much as you want about narrative okay. design or whatever you want, okay? I'm messing up, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not your fault. It was me who said to answer questions, so don't worry. Okay, so uh, I will continue with the worst, but I, I will try to do it short <laughs> because you, deal, you will deal with this, you know, in game design theory. <laughs> So how we work? A lot of people, um, one question that is really like in all the interviews I had or the people that asked me about game design, uh, interested in game design, obviously, uh, they ask me about methodologies and <coughs> framework. So uh, which framework do you use in when you work or which methodologies do you use? Did you use? So the first thing I want to share that with you, if I can, okay. Ah, oh, okay. It is that there is a lot of frameworks. MDA that you will see in game design theory that <laughs> lag with this. Uh, SM, 
framework, for example, the MDA is based on mechanics, dynamic, and aesthetics. So um, the frameworks are a way to describe our game, um, not only for uh, our audience, but for the team. So while you're working in a project, you have to create the GDD, the game design document, okay? So um, it's supposed to, you have to use a framework, okay? So that is uh, important when you, uh, when you study, right now you have studies before, 10 years ago we didn't have any study of this <coughs> and any experience of frameworks. And uh, you can you build your game with this framework. How? So you, can, you, you have to describe the mechanics that are the rules, the dynamics that are the gameplay and the aesthetic that is like, you know, the look and feel and the feel, the sensation and all in relation with your player and what do you want to um, achieve and, and to feel the player. So, uh, but at the end, in the real life, uh, we don't use any specific framework. We really use like a, a layout that is called TDD and we describe all the, uh, the description of the game and all the rules following this framework. But this uh, in relation with the, uh, in, the, in the company. So uh, uh, every company has a different layout or framework. And I want to add that uh, the MDA is super interesting. It's interesting to have like, a, you know, in theory. But I think it's some old, is uh, like a bit old uh, from now on because uh, from three or four years ago, we are focusing more and more in player centric approaches that that really uh, ha has in, ha we, have in <laughs> we have in camp the player. You know what I mean? So uh, we are really working closely with UX designers, user, uh, user experience designers, and we are trying to give the better experience to the player. So we are not uh, focusing only in what we want to do uh, for the audience. So we are focusing more in our player, how is our player, how, uh, no, what one want to do for the game and so on. So the player centric approach is really interesting. And if you can read something about it, it's super cool. Because we have the user, as I put here, as co-creator. -crea it's not only the audience, it's a co-creator -crea for us. So it depends. <laughs> so and another methodology we used to use every day and you know I in the my first company I started working in in Scrum in agile methodologies is uh, agile methodologies. What what is agile methodologies? Agile methodologies is a way to work. <laughs> That's all. So uh, if um, you think in a old company and other company that is not of uh, development or games, uh, you know that uh, you are working like in a straight line. You are analysis. You have the analysis. You have the design, the code, and you test. Okay, but it was like the old way of work. Right now we are not working like this. We are working in sprints. That uh, in the sprints is like a short period of, of time, and we review. That is agile. We review and we change. We, know, we uh, don't wait until the end of the development. We um, uh, constantly uh, stop, review, and change. So this is agile. So uh, we used to <coughs> we used to play. Uh, well, I want to show you a one video <laughs> first, and I will explain you later. Oh, shit. sorry, I didn't change the link and I put in Spanish because I had the presentation in Spanish for other, other people, sorry. <laughs> I cannot. Okay, the, the video was a funny way to understand the Scrum and I, I can explain it. <laughs> I can explain to you. Um, the Scrum 
uh, this is a methodology to work daily with the team. So basically, this is what, I, what it is. Um, we use, if you think in a game, when you have the idea, I can, I can show you the faces, I think. Let me show. Yeah, this, this was, wasn't planned, but I think it's useful for you. Present. Okay. <clears throat> oh, oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, we used to start brainstorming an idea. And we, when we have the idea, we pitch the idea. So we present the idea to the, to the team or to the stakeholders, whatever, if we have, um, or a product company, so the super bosses. <laughs> and uh, when we agree that this idea is okay, and the stakeholder says, yes, we go, we still, <laughs> we go, and we start with the concept phase. The concept phase, um, it's like a preparation for the pre-production. We validate our, our ideas and we can start prototyping in that point. So uh, take this in mind. So while I, we are, we are um, we are starting with this uh, pre-production. We make a really really long list of things to do. Okay, this is the product backlog simplified way. <laughs> so we have a lot of lists, uh, a big list of things we have to do. So we have to plan in order to um, tackle all these, uh, all these things to do, right? So we split in sprints. What is a sprint? It's a period of, of time. Normally, usually it's 15 days in all the companies, but if you need it, you can change for one or three weeks. So in these 15 day, days, we take tasks from the pro product backlog to do. And we take the, the most important thing. So the things we want to show at the beginning. So we take the things to do, we plan and we, okay, we are gonna do this 10 tasks in these 15 days, okay. So every day with the, the Scrum, Philosophy Scrum, we have a daily scrum. What is a daily scrum? It's a meeting. It's a meeting with the team when we talk about the things we are doing this day and we did the, the last day. So it's really dynamic and you are always aware of everything. So it's really, really, really useful to see if something is going wrong. In the old system, uh, we didn't speak. So we, okay, we have two months to make the, the game, okay. Uh, okay, so this day we have to show the game. Okay, so you are working internally with the with your team, but you are not maybe seeing what marketing is doing or what the developers are doing or whatever. So this is really important the visibility for all the teams. So you can you can see things that are going wrong or you can you know you have feedback for for them and you can change the idea or whatever. So in the daily, daily scrum, we talk with the team about the things we are doing. And you know, in 15 days, we have a demo. What is a demo? We can show what, uh, the things we did in these 15 days. Sometimes we can show uh, a build of the game, like an executable uh, build, or we can show a presentation or whatever. And the retrospective is after the demo. After this demo, we had a meeting that usually is one hour, and when we explain uh, what we did well and what we or what we can improve, that is the more import important thing. No, what we did wrong, what we can improve. So the basically the most important thing of the Scrum is the change. That is because is uh, that's why it's agile. You know what I mean? So so we plan, we produce, we inspect in the retrospective and we adapt to this so we can change. So in that way, uh, everything is more dynamic, more agile <laughs> and uh, it's better because we are improving uh, from time to time. In the old process, I, I had in, I had, <laughs> I worked in, in several companies that um, we used to work like in the old days and it's really bad because uh, you cannot see and the the mistakes you are you know you are you are dealing and you you are dealing with a lot of things and you didn't know because you don't see the full process and you don't inspect from time to time 
<clears throat> if you have more questions, give it for the... <laughs> and uh, this is more like game specific um, tasks from game design. So what I do every day, for example. So, for example, now I'm in, in concept phase in the game I am, I'm working on. So basically I'm working in the GDD. But uh, as general tasks I, we used to do is create and pitch new ideas, uh, brainstorming, make the presentation, one page document is a document that you explain all the basics of your game in one page that is super useful to make a presentation to the team. Uh, we documentate, this is like the ba basic uh, task every day, documentation. So you have not only to create the GDD, that it's in that sense, I think it's super important to know that the GDD is not a document for you, it's a document for the team. So this document must be useful for the team because the team must to read it, uh, must to understand uh, what do you want to do. <laughs> and you have to share this uh, game design document with the team just to check and uh, check the feedback and the questions uh, can come in through this reading and uh, not only um, writing down all the GDD, but reviewing, for example, I think some, something super interesting that we don't usually, to, <laughs> usually do, but I'm really pushing for this in my company right now, is uh, updating the GDD. Because uh, when you are working at the beginning, uh, okay, everything is clear in the GDD, but when you are working in the feature or you are, you are finished the game, maybe all the features <laughs> you describe it in the document change. All. So it's really important to update the GDD when you change things because in the future, maybe somebody can must uh, take your document and make another game or read it. So, um, it's super important to update the GDD. That is, I think is a, is a pain in the ass sometimes, but it must be do. <clears throat> and the content, this is another task we used to do as, for example, level designer or narrative designer, sometimes you have to create content. So you have to create tests or you have to create new levels or whatever. And as game designer as well, um, you have to create uh, features, for example, a new feature. So uh, we, we, need, we need something new in the game. So, okay, we are gonna have a live op that is like a new feature in the game that you have a competition, for example, and you have to you know, create another feature, update the GDD and blah, blah, blah. So a new content for the game. And be the captain and the link, I think is super important, the link in the team, because uh, sometimes um, the game designers are not only, um, you know, game designers, are like the communicate, this is not well explained, and how can I explain? Uh, the communication is super important uh, to be a good game designer, because uh, you will have to deal with developers, with artists, with producers, and you are in the middle. <laughs> so you have to be super careful about your communication, be super re respectful, humble, that is super important, because in my experience, I show a lot of uh, really bold <laughs> game designers, and I think it's not a, a, a good way to go. Uh, you have to be humble, you have to share your ideas with others, you have to, you know, mm, uh, give feedback and receive feedback, that is more important, and to answer all the questions, and to be really the link of you know, all the team, like a captain that drives everything. And <laughs> do you want to work in games? So, uh, I want to give you uh, my advice is that study because right now you have a really good opportunity with this uh, career that we didn't have in the past. Sounds like an old lady, but it's the reality. <laughs> and uh, the more game jams, the better. I think it's super important. Go to game jams and and do games and do project, personal project as, as well, because 
this is what you are gonna show to when you apply for a job you have to show this your games uh, i did 10 game jams these games and you know i participate with a lot of a lot of people that is super important as well the teamwork super important essential so uh, in the interviews for sure they will ask you about uh, how do you you know, communicate how do you you know the relation between the people in these game jams <laughs> because it's super important how do you interact interact with the people and keep updated your linkedin is you know it's obvious but um, some people doesn't have linkedin and super important the companies contact you by linkedin a lot and it's super a tool super important too right now and tips i want to finish with these three things that do what you like and never give give up is my advice because for example i was working in at in advertising for five years at the beginning and i never give up i never give up in my mind that i i love games and i want to work in games and when i had the opportunity i took it so never give up if you don't like something change it so if for, this is a good example a good advice uh, when you are working for example in a company or when you are studying or for your life if you don't like something change it you don't <laughs> you don't have to wait um, in you know for you know the magical solution of change it and be grateful every day i think uh, you have to be grateful and i think it's these three things help me a lot in my career and in my life and yeah this is the the finish but i want to share with you something from outfit <laughs> Seven, that is my actual company. I'm really happy. I'm only, and it's, it's true, it's not a lie. <laughs> I'm really happy. Uh, I want to play with you. And, oh, what? Something's happened here. Ah, yeah. Mm. Shit. <laughs> okay, I want to play with you and ask you what uh, is 410. <laughs> but I think that I spoil it. <laughs> so, in Outfit 7, uh, we have 410 million monthly users. Our um, players are kids uh, from 7 to 12 years old right now, but we are making different games uh, with different. Uh, kind of player, so we will see in the future. We are working in new games and new exciting games. And yeah, I can play right now. So what means 250 in my company? 150 what? Somebody? <laughs> what? Workers. Yeah, employees, employees yeah. We are 250 employees and five <laughs> and countries. We are in, in Slovenia, Spain, we are in Kisuri, Cyprus, uh, UK, London, and in China. That we are really, really big in China as well. And the most important things in my company is the productivity the creativity, the innovation, and the risk. Because uh, we not only have uh, runners for kids, we are uh, trying to expand our types and genres of games. So we are really there. <laughs> and uh, we had uh, the last week uh, a game jam, and it was amazing, the quality and the different ideas we had. And we are really big as well in YouTube. We have uh, 70, 65 billion digital views per month and uh, 2.6 million hours per day of, um, you know, of YouTube. Because uh, Talking Tom is not only big uh, as game, but uh, cartoon. We have a YouTube uh, channel that is really, really big for kids. <clears throat> and in China, we have a thematic park 
that is really awesome in Sansu. Uh, uh, we had a lot of merchandising around talking food and friends. Thank you. <laughs> I have here the you know the address of outfit jobs. If you are interested, I, I know you are in you know first year, but for for the future because we have twenty five open positions right now. <laughs> 